Hi, James Rowe with CS Breakdown, and today we're going to be going over elliptical curve cryptography algorithms. This type of cryptography is significantly more secure than modern day cryptographic functions such as RSA. So let's dive in. So like many cryptographic systems, elliptic curve cryptography gains its strength in mathematics. So generally we're looking at curves of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are some constant values. They usually can be real numbers, integers, or rational numbers, and so on. So here's an example of what some elliptic curves may look like. Now, elliptic curves use special arithmetic, and although they can be represented using standard algebra, they actually require their own definitions for things like addition and multiplication. So before we dive into how elliptic curve cryptography works, we need to understand how addition and multiplication might actually work. So first, we're going to consider addition. Let's say this is the curve in consideration, and we want to add two points A and B. Well, to add these two points, we need to draw the line between them. Now notice that there will always be a third intersection point. No matter where these two A points A and B are, there will always be a third point of intersection on the graph, with a few exceptions that we'll talk about in just a moment. So from this third intersection point, we can draw a vertical line down, and across the x-axis, is where it intercepts the curve again is actually going to be the sum of the first two points. So here we've added a and b and it's actually equal to the point c. So we can define the intermediate point on the top half of the curve as x and this is actually important because the addition requires a third intercept point but adding two vertical points is an undefined procedure. So this results in what's referred to as the elliptic identity, and this is commonly denoted as infinity. So the reason for this is because when we're trying to add two vertical points, there will never be a third interception, and we can't define that addition. So now let's consider trying to add a point to itself. If we were adding a point to itself, of course there's no second point to be considered, and we can't draw a line between these points. So instead, we're actually able to just draw the line tangent to A and find where that intersects. So in this case, we've drawn the line tangent to A, and all we need to do is the same procedure as before. We draw a vertical line based on where that intercepted the curve, and across the x-axis, we'll find the sum of A and A. So we're going to label that B. Now, this is actually referred to as point doubling, and this is a a common way to achieve multiplication. So this is actually very similar to what's called the square and multiply algorithm. So if you repeatedly point double, you're actually doing what's, what's considered multiplication in terms of elliptic curves. So we're just going to refer to this point as 2 times a. Now we're going to consider 3a and see what has to be done next. So again, like I said, to perform some multiplication 3 times a, we're actually just going to perform point, point doubling three times. So we're going to add A to itself three times. What would happen then is we draw the line between 2A and A, and wherever that intercepts the curve, we flip across the x-axis, and then it's a similar process to what we've just shown before. So you can see that there's a lot of jumping around the graph to perform even just a few multiplications. So this computation is actually very similar to the square multiply algorithm like I previously mentioned. This is where elliptic curve cryptography gets its strength, as it's infeasible to divide the multiplications and find a specific point that you multiplied you there, unlike in regular algebra. So for example, if you're given the number 10, and someone says, I multiplied 5 to give you the number 10, you obviously know the other mul multiplication is going to be from 2. So this doesn't hold true for elliptic curves, and this is actually what's known as the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. So to compute the multiplier point, you would need to calculate all the multiples of the given point until you find the one that matches. But this is not possible, especially when using sufficiently large values in a reasonable amount of time due to the computational complexity of this problem. So now, how can we use this to our advantage? There are many applications of the elliptical curve properties in cryptography. In a previous video on Bitcoin's cryptographic implementations, we discussed the elliptical curve digital signing algorithm. So feel free to check that video out if you're interested. But today we're actually going to be going over elliptical, elliptic curve cryptography as it applies to the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. 
So let's consider Alice and Bob, and let's say they want to communicate. They have some form of communication, but this form is not secure, so they're aware that someone is going to be eavesdropping on whatever messages they'll be passing back and forth. Diffie-Hellman lets them use public and private key pairs to pass messages. So to do this, they per agree on parameters for some elliptic curve so that they can pass a secret back and forth by computing points along the curve based on these public parameters. So again, this is where the elliptical curve discrete logarithm problem comes in, as they can have public parameters share their points publicly, calculated based off these parameters, and they're still able to contain a secret because it's computationally infeasible for Charlie to figure out what their private keys were. So now let's discuss what these domain parameters actually represent. So P is the field that the curve is defined over, and this provides scalars for a vector space, and you don't really need to know too much about linear algebra to be able to implement this kind of cryptography, but if you're interested, there's actually a lot going on with fields and elliptic curves. So A and B are parameters defining the curve, and in the above examples, we actually used negative 2 and 2, or 2 and 7 in both of the curves I previously showed from Wolfram Alpha. So G is the generator point, and this point is just some fixed point on the curve that we're going to use to multiply all of our future points by. Now n is the prime order of g, and all that really means is that n is the smallest prime number such that n times g will equal the elliptic identity. So considering the multiplication we previously defined, n times g, so the scalar multiplication of this prime number n, times the generator point g, which is public, is going to be the elliptic identity or infinity. It's an undefined procedure. So the smallest n that gives us this undefined procedure. And then the final domain parameter is h, and h is just the cofactor calculated as the number of points over the curve n. So we want this to be as small as possible because the number of points divided by n, so n is our prime order of g, and and we have a number of points across the curve. If this number is as small as possible, it implies that the points are well distributed across the curve. So ideally, we actually want our cofactor to be one. So now let's talk about how Alice and Bob could send a message back and forth using their public and private key pairs. So first, each of them will select a random value d where d is between 1 and n minus 1. Remember, n was the prime order of our generator point g. So from here, they'll each calculate some point, which is their random number, times the generator point. So your public key is the transfer between Alice and Bob is the xy coordinates of this point. Now remember, despite knowing the generator point g, as well as the xy coordinates of the multiplication, you cannot figure out the value d. So recall again, this is the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. So because they both have multiplied their random points by g, they're able to pass each other their points, and their random value d is their private key, and this is going to be not feasible for Charlie to figure out. So let's consider that Alice has d, Bob has e, and these are their respective private keys, and they're going to swap the information publicly, but first by calculating these points P and Q. So Alice computes her point P, which is her random private key, times the public key generator point. So this point P is going to be public as well. Bob does the same with his point E times the generator point, generating point Q. Keep in mind that Charlie is able to hear this whole thing, and he has b both points P and Q, and despite also knowing the generator point G, he's unable to compute E or D in this transaction. Or at least he can't do so very easily. So once they've passed their points P and Q, they use each other's points to calculate a third and final point R using their random values. So Bob will compute R, which is his own private key, times Alice's point, And Alice will compute R, which is her own private key, times Bob's point. So keep in mind, because of this, r is actually equal to both of their private keys times the generator point, which gives some x and y coordinates. Now, because both of these private keys, d and e, are not uh, feasible to calculate and, of course, are kept private, 
this point r is also private. So at this point r, this is where they're going to be hiding their values or passing their secrets. So it's most common that the x coordinate of the r point is being passed. And although it's just a number, it's usually a hashed version of the information being transferred. So if they wanted to transfer some message, they would hash it into a number and then compute this point and the opposing party would have to use the same hash system to figure out what the uh, numerical representation actually meant. So now that they've done this, that's actually all. They've successfully passed each other this point R and this point R's X value is hiding their secret information. So now that they've done this, they would likely use some hash system like I previously mentioned and they both have successfully transferred a message without Charlie knowing. So now as a result they're both happy and they've successfully transferred some message. So that's a general overview of elliptical curve cryptography especially as it applies to the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. So it's obvious that it's computationally infeasible to calculate these private keys and that's where um, this garners all of its strength because mathematicians have been working on the elliptic curve properties for years, maybe three decades, and they've still found no efficient algorithm that's better than the general naive approach of factorizing the, um, the generator point or any point to find its multiplications. So this is why e elliptical curve cryptography is one of the most secure cryptographic systems in use today. And it actually requires fewer bits in key size representation when compared to cryptographic systems like RSA to equal the same level of security. So I hope this video was helpful, guys. Please be sure to check out our other videos on CS Breakdown. Please like and favorite. Thanks for watching.